All right, so today we've got a couple topics we prepared. We're going to talk about the Sunday blues. We're going to talk about the no complaint challenge. And then, Teresa, you have a news story that you want to talk about today that uh, kind of came to your attention over the past week, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. Yes. Well, cool. Let's get into this um, Sunday blues topic. I know we have talked about this before, mm -hmm. how, and if I'm understanding it correctly, you're talking about that, I don't know, like two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, you just sort of have this like for like this dread that sort of hangs over you. Yeah. And some of it is related to perhaps Monday morning, the thought of going back to work. Um, maybe it's stuff that's kind of going on in your life. And there's just something about Sundays that almost amplifies all of this. Am I on, on the right track with that? You're exactly on the right track. Yes. Um, well, um, it's not uncommon. Oh, and it's Sunday today, by the way, we should mention that. It is Sunday today. So this is, this is matching. And But are you feeling blue right now? I am. Well, I, this, this is, um, I've got so much to say about this. Um, I felt the absolute blues up until now, now that I'm just looking at you and talking to you and I'm having a glass of, um, Prosecco, I'm feeling a bit better. And it's a little later in the day for you. I'm having a coffee, um, it's, no, no Bailey's it's, in it, but yeah, uh, it's two o'clock here right now. Um, Sunday blues have been, I have been having them for as long as I can remember. And I'm not alone with that. It's actually fairly common for adults, but also children to feel it. Obviously, when you're a child or a teenager, you don't really know what to do with that. Um, says that I looked up the statistics, um, 60 to 70 percent of all people feel some sort of the Sunday blues, which is defined as, um, anxiety, a bit of a depression, sometimes induced panic, feeling the lethargic, demotivated, and it comes from, well, the, you know, us dwelling about having to go back into work on a Monday, we're getting nervous about how we're going to perform and just going back into that I think I read something about getting back into the routine that you have for five days um, out of a week. And then your Saturday and Sunday, very often you don't have a routine, right? One Saturday you might go out, one you might not. And then you, you do all sorts of different things on a weekend, whereas during the week you have more of a routine. So it's anxiety of going back into that and... At the same time, you don't know what's expecting you. I, we, You know, when you're in a busy job, you don't know what's going to really jump at you. So I've been having this ever since I was a child and I was asking around in my family and we all suffer from it. My, well, not all, but most members do. My grandmother has it big time. She's sitting upstairs now watching probably a documentary with grandpa. And she'll, if I walk up to her, she'll be like, oh, Sunday, I hate it, this Sunday feeling. And <laughs> mind you, she's 90 years old, right? Her life doesn't change much at all, right? She doesn't have a job to go back to. She just still right. has it. I had it as a child. My mom used to have it. My brother has it um, to the point where, and I visit my brother quite frequently, um, there's no point of me going down there. I love to go down and sit for a beer, and but I just know he, he won't be in shape. I won't be in shape. So, all we'd be doing then is almost we don't we don't talk about it, but it's we're feeling in each other's presence how depressed we really mm. are. So it's like this um, over it's like a cloud in a way, isn't it? That sort of overhangs. Absolutely. And I cannot do and look, it is um so I wake up Sunday mornings are usually okay. You know, wake up and you know have up until lunch and then after lunch, especially then having had a Sunday meal, which does, I never feel great after a heavy meal. Who does? Um, then that it really sinks in. So we're, and I'm having early lunches here. So we'll be done by latest 1230. So that's, you know, you do the math. Uh, that's another 10 to 12 hours of feeling miserable that are perfectly good value time of being lazy having yeah. a nap, going for a walk, exercising, you know, and it's just hanging over you. And so, yeah, it, it just 
all that helps me is knowing that a lot of people have that. Um, what I found has helped me a lot is is exercising. And I think I've said that before, but I really live out in on the countryside right now, just getting fresh air, being in the forest. What is what is your experience with the Sunday blues? Because you're not a stranger to it. No, not at all. And I would say that the Sunday blues, I remember going back into my like early adolescence. So Were you still maybe, being given captain's head at that captain's hats at that stage? Oh uh, yes, my dad loved to give me a captain's hat about every four years. I would get a brand new one, which I mentioned in a previous episode. Um, well, the thing was, as I do remember going back, yeah, easily into when I, I think about where I was living when I would have some thoughts and this was would have been in our second house I guess we were we were living in at this time where I remember Sundays just it was homework assignments that weren't complete that well it wasn't necessarily at 10 years of age but things that for me always amplified Sunday blues or maybe was the cause of Sunday blues were things like science projects that hadn't been started yet and were due like Monday Mm -hmm. Um, a test that was going to, that was coming up where I knew I didn't, I hadn't studied for it. I wasn't ready. Um, but one thing that amplified Sunday blues for me, especially when I was younger, was the fact that the retail stores were closed Yeah, and there was just something about this empty kind of loneliness that would, would go on as you drive by a mall and see like an empty parking lot mm -hmm. and or if you needed something like if you were you were you needed batteries or you needed some thing at a at a hardware store you were totally stuck so it was always that like i can't imagine what it would be like today yeah. our stores are closed on sundays yeah. Yeah. so i know exactly what you mean do you think for me the the thing was that there was the, there was this loneliness about that and now that was when i was a kid today i might actually almost look at that and be calmed by it like driving by a mall that for once isn't hustling and bustling on a sunday you know that that day of rest so to speak mm -hmm. we don't see that the only time you ever see that at least here in north america it would be christmas day that's the only day that everything is basically closed even restaurants most restaurants are closed so it's the only day where you drive by a mall and it's an empty parking lot or where you go to a restaurant or you drive by a restaurant and the doors are closed and it's dark inside. So I found as a kid, the whole everything being closed on Sunday totally made it more depressing for me. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was it was lone. There was a loneliness to it. Just this kind of weird loneliness. I guess one question I had for you was, do you get this every single Sunday or some days it's there, some days it's not, some day, some some Sundays it's worse than other Sundays. Like, yeah, do you get it every Sunday? Clear answer is absolutely yes. I have not, I have yet to experience a Sunday where I didn't have it. Um, but there is nuances to it. Um, well, there might have been a time without Sunday blues when I was between jobs for maybe four weeks, maybe five weeks, and I think then I didn't have it. But ever so, since you then, really I've... associate you really associate by the sounds of it because we talked about this before we started recording. Yeah, you were mentioning me and and my job situation, and maybe I won't have Sunday blues for a while because I'm not working at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you really do tie the job in with the Sunday blues. Yeah, absolutely. I I um I hugely identify with um whatever job or position I have I've held so far. Um it's and I have um interestingly I have spoken to a colleague about that and I said I'm not sure if this sounds lame, but there is not much else going on in my life. It's pretty sad, actually. You know, a lot of people my age have kids and a partner or a horse or a house and a <laughs> garden and, you know, all of these things. Whereas I look at my life and apart from a job and my travels, right? So travels is, is my big thing, but that's not happening right now. Um, there isn't much 
I don't know, our Sunday blues, perhaps a bit of a luxury. If I had two or three kids running around now, perhaps my mind wouldn't be wandering so much because what it really does, the mind wanders off into Monday into, mm. you know, God, all of the problems that might occur starting on Monday. Um, so, but there's nuances, right? It, it is weather dependent in, obviously, um, it's dependent on the season. Um, I was just gonna, you spoke about Christmas. And my brother and I, it's, it's turned into like a standard thing we say every year. My brother and I hate January 1st. Um, it's usually gray, miserable, cold. Um, I, I, you know, most of my life I have spending New Year somewhere in, you know, either the UK or Switzerland or Germany. So never really in a, in a beautiful country with great weather. And so it's gray and dull and it's, I mean, that's probably the closest I'd ever feel to like run a hot bath and get some razor blades, um, which I'm <laughs> kidding, kidding about, obviously now. But um, it's uh, and my brother feels the same. It's it's just that is if if general Sundays are bad, um, January first is just a nemesis. That's yeah. interesting about January first because I always I like January first because it's that day often it's the day after you know obviously new year's eve and and it's the day you kind of just veg out um so i never really identified january 1st except if january depended on when january 1st fell if january 1st was on a friday i loved it because you still had like two more days before mm -hmm. you had to go back to work or school and also very dependent when i was a kid with respect to January 1st or any sort of like that, especially the Christmas holidays was when did, when did you have to go back to school? There was something ultra depressing and bluesy about having to go back to work the day after January 1st. Oh, yeah. 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 So I always liked it when it fell on a, a third, a Friday or a Saturday, at least where you had at least one buffer day between Friday was the best because you knew there was no gap where you were going to have to go back into work for a day. You had like January 1st and then like two straight days of more sitting around and not having to go back to work. It's interesting though. I mean, maybe this is something we can tackle for a, another episode is where a little more around the why behind your working and why Sunday blues seems to happen. And is there anything that you could do to make that better you know yeah absolutely and i think I, I could continue i'm i think about it certainly a lot um now you've just said it you know it seemed now i cannot say for sure whether i had no sunday blues between jobs when i really didn't have to fulfill anything i can't fully remember if i'm going down the route my grandma is going right where she's 90 years old and still mm -hmm. experiences there is no hope for me perhaps maybe it's genetic <laughs> genetically like imposed on you but we can we can do some more research on that um i i like these topics where we go a bit deeper we peel back the layers i think we should bring Oma on the podcast and get her take on Sunday blues. But we'd have to have a translator, <laughs> which would be funny actually in itself. Can you imagine? All right. All right. Maybe Oma on a future episode. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Got to be a video one, though. Yeah. We'll have to decide whether we advance into broadcasting. YouTube, this yeah. As a, broadcasting. As a, a lot of people do that. They do these like like Joe Rogan and other podcasters will actually do an audio, but they'll also video it as well. So maybe that's something for the future. All right. So on to the product side of things where we talk about something we want to plug. Um, for me, I've been thinking about this one for a while is I am absolutely enjoying the subscription to Masterclass that I signed up for. And for those that don't know Masterclass, I, I find it still funny. There are some people who don't know what I'm talking about when I mention Masterclass, but Masterclass is a series of, I think, 80 or more now videos or classes where they take a celebrity or somebody uh, very uh, big in whatever the topic is. Um, and it spreads across 
creative, like writing and television, film directing, acting. I would say it, it's more in the creative space uh, as a general rule, but then there are also other topics such as negotiation by Chris Voss or Robin Roberts, who's from Good Morning America. She So these guys basically run a master class on their field of study or their their career or their vocation. And I love it. I've been watching, I think I've watched about five or six of these. I watched the Ken Burns, How to Make Documentary. I watched Chris Voss uh, on Negotiation, Robin Roberts, Good Morning America. Really enjoyed that. And um, there's stuff on how to write for television. And I love it. So I highly recommend Masterclass. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Yep, um, and I'm I'm with you um, on that. I think we signed up during the um, pretty much at the same time, and we've been, um, if you don't mind me putting it out, they've been fangirling over Chris Voss a little bit. <laughs> Equally, <laughs> yes. I'm fangirling over Robin Roberts. Um, I've just finished her. Uh, oh, you listen, you, you listen to her. Fantastic, okay. absolutely brilliant. Um, but by the way, I found, and I, I know I'm dragging this topic out now, but. For my Sunday blues, I find watching something that is such, all of these episodes are such a masterpiece in terms of, I don't know what the word is, but probably s- cinematography. It, they're just visually so appealing and they're so uplifting yes, that that is, they are that is a cure for me. Beautifully okay. written, beautifully, yeah. uh, or not, the design, the, the overlays, Screenplay. the little between What's segments, the, word? the it's yeah. it's beautifully done and, and and I talked to somebody else who had seen the commercials and they said wow if the commercials are as if the sh- if the actual content is as good as the commercials then I, I want to sign up and I mm-hmm. said yeah absolutely what you see in those commercials they're so beautifully produced and it translates right into the actual episodes or the actual classes so highly recommend it yeah. And I, I don't understand. I have come across people who haven't heard of Masterclass yet. And I wonder how is it? Cause it has, Masterclass has been screaming at me to, um, subscribe to it on Facebook for, for a very long time. And I remember, you know, all of these ads that come at you and Facebook or elsewhere, um, until I finally did it. Um, it's targeted so I, advertising, I, I think. I, you know, it, yeah, it must have spotted something in my, behavior so (laughs) but anyhow talking about advertisements so the project that i have um been ordering uh, i ordered it probably like three or four weeks ago it's again it's it's a beauty product um and it's by charlotte tilbury it's called the unisex healthy glow and it's an all-year hydrating summer tint moisturizer and it's really nice um it just it comes out quite whitish but then you apply it on your skin and it turns into a bit of a tint i'm not wearing it Hmm. right now you can probably tell because i'm looking quite tired (laughs) but um (laughs) it's it's a really nice product um it's just so easy to apply i'm i'm not a massive makeup person um but this is just something that I'll put on before I, you know, walk out, go to the go to the supermarket, and I don't look like entirely horrible with red patches all over my my face, for example. Um, so what's the who's the who makes this again? Charlotte Tilbury. Um, you might not know that, but that's a that's um, it's not the highest. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a mid mid price section sort of. Um, I mean, this cost me. It's a little tub of forty mil, and it cost me. I think it was around thirty dollars. So it's not cheap as such, but um, mm-hmm. it's also not, you know, it's not Sisley or La Mer, for example, who who run products like these for hundreds of dollars. Um, yeah. And you said it's unisex, so it it's men can unisex. Wear it too. Well, yeah. So I mean, it, it, it. I guess it depends a little bit on your complexion. Um, if you're incredibly um, pale, you you might think in its first instance it looks a bit orangey on you, um, but it has this. It just matches your skin. I mean, you could, and it doesn't have any shimmer to it. It's there's one YouTuber I watched advertising this, and they said, you know how all of these beauty products they advertise like it's almost like you put a filter across your face, like a like a well, you know, like these filters filters on your on your phones and this one really does it so it gives you Hmm. you know you're looking less pixelated up here (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. Something to think about for future Zoom calls. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So now we're going to move on to the no complaint challenge. And geez, when did this come up? A couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. I, mm-hmm. I stumbled across this. A friend of mine who's a big Tim Ferriss fan, and I'm also a Tim Ferriss fan. I I really enjoy some of the books he's written, and he also has a podcast. And my friend Martin, he stumbled across this um, No Complaint Challenge through Tim Ferriss, which I think if I get it right, the the gist of it is you put a, a, a band on one arm or one wrist, and it can be something as simple as an elastic band or, you know, one of those sort of like... Um, Lance Armstrong kind of bands and the idea is that anytime you complain about something you take the band and switch it over to the other wrist and the idea is that it's a 21 day challenge where the you try to get to the point where you don't complain for 21 straight days and this when I mentioned it to you it really spoke to you and I wanted to get your take on why that was Um, yeah, you did. Um, you sent, well, you and I spoke about doing some sort of a challenge at some point of time and we had various ideas. And then, um, you know, we, we thought that'd be a great time once you've settled into your new home. Um, there you are. And then you sent me this link and we immediately agreed this would be a great thing to do. And I feel for me, it's great because the more I think about it, I think I'm a complainy, complainy bitch. I like to, I get irritated and triggered (laughs) just about everything immediately. Um, I have no calm whatsoever. Um, I might even be a bully and a backstabber. Um, I think I'm finding that out about myself. Um, because Anyhow, you've been so th- trying to start this this challenge, right? You've you've had you've been playing around with it a little bit over the last yes, couple weeks. Yes, and I I have no. I've been watching. I've been watching my mouth a little bit ever since you brought that first up. And now we started this. Well, I think I did. We start at the same day. I'm not sure. You might have started two days earlier than I did, or so. But I finally found this bracelet that my my um, nephew once made me, and I had it lying around. So it's it looks like a friendship friendship bracelet. That's what we used to call it, those bracelets. Yeah, exactly. So I had that lying around. Rainbow. It's like, oh, you know what? Rainbow. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I took it, and I was like, okay, here's the day. Now, with a, with a challenge, you have to. So each time you complain. Um, you switch wrists. Um, but I think you also start from scratch, right? You want to do it for 21 days of not complaining, which, um, equals to 21 days of not having to flip the wrist. Correct. Yeah. Um, and I am, I am, I'm back to day one and I've been on it for, um, six days now. Um, and it's, however, I don't mind that, right? The, I think, and you can, agree or disagree with me here. I think that the thing is that you don't want to complete simply 21 days of not complaining, which would be fantastic, obviously, but it's about being mindful about how many complaints that are entirely unnecessary leave your mouth every single Mm. day. Um, and it's, yeah, I think um, that's important to say is that I think it isn't so much about, you're right, going 21 straight days of not complaining. I probably didn't quite get that. And of course, it's up to everyone to interpret this challenge in any way they want to. What it, what I think it is, is you take 21 days where, you, like you said, you're kind of monitoring and, and keeping yourself in check and noticing how much you actually complain. Because the physical mm-hmm. act of taking this band for me i'm just using a rubber band until i find something more suitable maybe the 21 days will be over before i do but um the, the whole act of saying to yourself oh yep there's a complaint i gotta take this off and put it on the other wrist it's an it's a gesture that it, it allows you that moment of of pause so mm-hmm. um so how many times a day would you say you're flipping over to the other wrist um, it's gone between um, it's gone between two and seven to eight times probably, mm. and now um, there is probably there must be some you know if I 
say I was aware of eight complaints switched at eight times, I'm pretty sure the actual number of complaints is more like 10 or 12. Um, Here's a funny story. The other day I went um, cycling with my um, nephew and I had told him about the challenge and he had a mighty giggle about it. He thought it was so funny. And I How was wearing your nephew? His, he's nine. Um, okay. and he's just so easily entertained as well. He loves these things. Um, and we were, um, we were cycling and then I got him an ice cream. We we're sitting on a bench and I just, I knocked my my shin on the bench. So, you know, I was cursing about it and, oh, stupid bench, how silly and you're just going on about it. He's like, oh, you need to flip the switch. Like your kids, I think they have done that to you too. Yes, It wouldn't have. have occurred to me that that was, you know, I was just bursting out. Um, and then one minute later, I was trying to, exp whilst I was then explaining again this challenge to him, I was looking for a word and I was like cursing about me not being able to think of the word I was looking for. I said, like, oh, you got to switch it again. There you and go. It was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah. okay, that, this is where this has come up. So I, my wife is aware of this challenge and I shared it with my brother-in-law as well and his wife. And we had this little debate about it where we were like, well, hold on a sec. Is, is venting about something and is that really complaining? So if you bang yourself on the bench, is it the the act of the pain and you're complaining about the pain or like what you sort of alluded to, which was the stupid bench? Like, So you're blaming mm -hmm. an inanimate object, something that did nothing to try to hurt you. So what what is the what is the difference? Like I, that's why I feel like you almost need some some sort of ground rules. Yeah. Because my wife mentioned, she says, well, wait a sec, if you suppress every sort of thing that bothers you, aren't you just making it worse by bottling it up? I, yeah, exactly. And I've been, well, number one, I've been, I've been thinking about exactly what you just said a lot. Um, and I think that, and, and second, I think that is a good thing because the more you, you know, that just goes into the being mindfulness about it. Um, yes. And here is, and, and we both discuss that um, this challenge is a little bit um, fuzzy around the edges because, you know, but it has needs to have some ground rules. And here is how I see it. It's unnecessary complaints, things that could have gone unsaid, um, energy wasted on complaints mm. that mm. are not worth your time. Yes. Now, silly bench, stubbing your toe. I mean, who isn't going to curse? So, you know, I obviously went with it because my, my nephew was really entertained by it, too. Um, yeah. But, you know, the other day I had, um, on on a more serious note, I had set up with my grandparents and I had moaned about a family thing. Um, I had to just vent about it. And I knew I had to switch wrists afterwards. And then I, you know, went back to my part my my quarters in the house and I thought about it and you know it just made me think about it and I thought it wasn't necessary for me to say the things that I said I could have or I you know or it it made me think about solutions like how there is this issue how do I want to go about it in the future perhaps right um, how how could I make it things better? Which brings me on to the point of the challenge whereby the way we read it and the way we looked it up, it says you can basically forgive yourself for complaining if your complaint is immediately followed with a cure. Um, mm. So... Mm -hmm. um, you mean like a reframing almost? Like, like a re exactly, right? Okay, there's um, this... Like example, there's a car, a truck that parks in front of our house every day because there's a construct there's construction going on down the way. Uh, there's a house being built, and there's this truck that pulls up in front of our house. And actually, I didn't even think about the fact that it was there and it wasn't bothering me. But the person who was driving the truck pulled in yesterday or a few days ago, and he actually apologized to us. We were sitting out on the front looking at the street. And the guy got out and he said, hey, guys, sorry, uh, sorry about the truck being parked here every morning. And we were we didn't really even think twice about the fact that it was bothering us. And then uh, so a few days later, so you, on Saturday, actually, it was yesterday, the truck pulled up 
in front of the house. And I'm like, seriously, on a Saturday, you're, you're here parking this. And I, and I stopped myself. I was like, wait a sec. What am I doing? I didn't even think of this until he actually mentioned that it could be bothering us, which it wasn't. But then I did a quick immediate reframe, which was, I was almost like, you know what? I'm so happy in a way that this truck is here because it means the world has kind of gone back to maybe some sort of normal that Mm -hmm. now a house is continuing to be built. It was probably on pause for, you know, a couple months and and now it's just good to see activity going on. And so maybe a little bit of a reframe at times. But um, one thing that Martin said to me that I really liked was he, his experience was that he was amazed how many times he had, he would hear the complaint in his head and then he would stop it from going to the voice box. Yep. Absolutely. And I think that's a big part of this exercise. Of uh, which I, look, I've been, what your wife's been saying about, are you then just bottling it up? And, and I think it's for everyone to decide, right? Surely there's complaints that, you know, if you're being bullied, if you're being mistreated, um, you know, th- then you gotta, find your voice, but find your voice for complaints at the right time for the right reasons. And surely that um, truck in front of your house just seems that your energy would have been wasted and well done on you finding a positive spin to that. And I think that is what this exercise is about. Like pause for a second and think like, wait a minute, what's, you know, no need for my head to, uh, you're compartmentalizing it and you're like, put it in the positive basket there's some positive spin around it there's actually um i'm 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 willing to say that in in each of our comfortable lives that we have there's probably very very little to complain about unless it's around health reasons or you know something happens to the family etc so uh, to me that's what it's about so this so tim ferris references a guy named bill bowen actually will bowen and um, I just went on his website here. It says, uh, so it, it's a complaint-free world, willbowen.com. I think this guy's a minister. And it was to his congregation he explained this whole no complaint thing. And so it says, join more than 11 million people worldwide who have taken Will Bowen's complaint-free challenge. Complaining is an epidemic that is destroying our happiness, relationships, health, and success. The problem is that most aren't even aware when they complain. As Will Bowen says, complaining is like bad breath. You notice it when it comes out of someone else's mouth, but not when it, when it comes out of your own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like that. And you can yeah. get bracelets on Bill, on Will Bowen's website. It uh, looks like purple bracelets. Yeah. So I like yours, though. Can maybe, maybe that's a great, maybe you can make me one or someone can make me one and I can have a nice yeah. one instead of this ugly elastic band that I found in a drawer. D- well, I, look, I'm, I have a lot of just bracelets, but I feel like, well, was, um, but, this is, I think this is a backpacking thing. <laughs> Backpackers tend to have a lot of bracelets. You pick them up wherever you go. And it's like, oh, I've been in Peru and here's this bracelet I found up in the Andy Mountains and now I'm going to wear it. And uh, any, I've got a lot of bracelets. That's what I'm trying to say. All right. Shall we move on? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you have a weird news story or or at least an interesting news story it sort of entered your, I think, entered your radar a few days back. Why don't you tell us about uh, what yeah. this is? So here is, here is what happened. I, um, I, I like to trade stocks. I like to invest. And, and so sometimes, whereas I'm a investor for for long term and I don't do any day trading of any sorts mostly but I do look for opportunities and I just had had looked around and something popped up on um actually on Reddit and this was Friday morning um Berlin time and it said Wayfair the big online furniture sales platform is about to get or might they get caught in a child trafficking um, scandal? And this, and then I looked into it, and the spin around it is that 
a Reddit user, this happened on, the, well, this is my night, night from Thursday to Friday, a Reddit user um, or a Twitter user, I'm not quite sure, had looked in, has found that on Wayfair, there is cabinets like metal cabinets. They look something that is made for like an industri- industrial building or so, like a workshop. Um and found they are really high priced. I mean, they're just normal metal cabinets, um, could be for offices as well. Um, and they're yeah. priced at 10,000 to 15,000 US dollars. Yeah. They have female names to them. And then this lady looked the female names up and she, they have very almost like exotic. It's not just Sarah and Julia, but it's more exotic sounding names. She's like, oh, let me Google this. And she found they link up, these names link up to missing children and teenagers. Um, and then this had absolutely by the time I found it had trended on Twitter. So Friday morning, my time, and then throughout Friday, hashtag Wayfair was trending on Twitter. People coming up with all sorts of examples from cabinets to um, later on pillows and rugs and throws that were, you know, a pillow running for 10,000 US dollars. And they all found the same pattern that the names Mm. of this product would link up to missing um, girls and boys. Um, and so they were thinking that I think on Wayfair, it's not just Wayfair selling its products, but if you were a producer of some sort of uh, a large, larger producer of some sort of a furniture type, this is just a marketplace for you. Um, so they're thinking that there's companies behind that, um, shell companies who are showing a picture of this and it's almost in the um pedophile world they they apparently use a lot of code that this could be actually a missing child um now um a lot of people then said wait a minute so am i buying this this cabinet and then a child is in there and then people like no 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 no, that's not how it works this is Uh people who will have knowledge about it where to go it is just that um child trafficking Somebody said it's not a deep web or a dark web thing anymore. It's in plain sight, obviously. It's, um, and it's, it's a code sort of thing. So somebody who looks at that cabinet will exactly know what they're in for. Um, yeah, and the one so, thing that's interesting about this is that uh, yeah, I was like just reading a little here. So Twitter, it was Twitter where this thing kind of was born out of, and then it was a Reddit user that that um, claimed there was something strange about these cabinets. And like you said, they range from like 12699 to 14999 And Wayfair has uh, obviously confirmed there's no truth to any of this stuff. And that they're saying the reason they're expensive is because they're these industrial grade cabinets. Correct. Um, what's interesting about this is, unlike a lot of these sorts of conspiracy theories, is that these things tend to be old old like stories you know where you where someone hears about it and starts talking it's like um yeah that was debunked like four years ago Mm -hmm. but this this is a very new story this literally came up starting on looks like july 11th was when this article was written which was a couple days after this issue surfaced but a lot what my point is a lot of these stories tend to be stuff that gets regurgitated that has long ago been kind of debunked but this is a a right now news story a conspiracy theory if you will um that's going on so this is this is happening right now whatever this is whatever this is um i i got sucked into reading a lot about it so um i you know what i'm whereas i am very much hoping for there not being any any hint of truth to that. I think I'm just going to follow it because um, I find it interesting. Um, even if it were just for online rumors, and that could be a topic for another um, for another uh, session. Um, mm-hmm. Topics that are s- rumors that are spread online and then gone to something big. Um, 
I went into the, or I went looking into this because people were then on the stock market betting on Wayfair stock to really drop, which I think on Friday it, it lost a not even not even three percent or. Some people might argue that's a lot, but you would have thought like it's a, it's a massive drop just on these rumors. Um, so that's what I had been looking out for. Not that I would have acted on that. Um, Sorry, but, is there a clicking, um, are you clicking something there? Oh, yeah, I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but it's interesting. I'll, I'll continue to see what comes out of that. Yeah, it is uh, very bizarre. And you mentioned, uh, yeah, there was there's the um, the Annabelle Five shelf storage unit was linked to Annabelle Wilson, a Kansas teenager who was reported missing in February. Yeah, um, interesting. They strange. they took down all of these cabinets um, once this started to be loud. So within six hours of this first trending. Um, Wayfair had taken down all of these cabinets, but then they found all of these pillows and rugs who had the same issue. Last time I checked, which was this morning, is, oh, this is happening on Etsy and Amazon as well. So who knows what what, what the truth to, to this is. Um, others have said sometimes um, sellers will really mark up a price if they are they're out of stock for this product because then nobody would be buying them anyways. And that's just an easier way of rather than taking down the advertisement and the product and deleting it and then having to upload it once stock is replenished. It's just, you know, you just put 30,000 in there. Nobody will buy it anyway. So, Mm, you know, you save yourself some work. Hmm. All right. Well, I guess we'll continue to monitor that story and see if anything changes on it and we can, talk about it again but uh yeah and i agree the conspiracy theories or these types of stories do often make for good good topics and um in a previous episode we talked about the moon landing and and there's all sorts of other stuff that's that's out there so maybe we can bring something else to the table later oh yeah okay i'm looking forward to that well i guess we should uh head out um good good chatting with you and uh Looking forward to the next time and good luck with the no complaint challenge. Hey, are we going to make this a, a thing we sort of keep a tab on? Maybe talk about each episode? I'd love to. Just... Yes, okay. it's, um, it's, I think it's very important. It might actually change my life for the better. All have right. a good, have a good one. You too. 